Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday. Now before we begin, if you're new to this channel, these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, health and wellness in general, something regarding nutrition or diet, Chinese medicine, herbalism, supplements, or anything regarding health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity. The questions that we feel are going to be the most beneficial to the group and channel as a whole, and of course the questions that we are capable of answering. And something else really great about these videos is that every week from the comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. Now even if you don't have a health question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs, all you have to do to be entered to win is just make sure you give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and then just drop any comment in the comment section below. And with all that being said, let's get to this week's questions. Alright, so taking a look at our first question, there's actually two questions here from this person. I'm going to quickly answer both of those. So this question reads, Hi Nick, I have two questions. Number one, why does my body look more bloated after weightlifting and what can I do about it? Number two, is it beneficial to take yin promoting herbs after a training session? Thank you. Okay, so answering these questions in numerical order, looking at the first question, why is it that your body looks more bloated after exercise? The thing that comes to mind for me is water retention or edema, so an overall puffiness in the body. If you're talking specifically about digestive bloat, like in the stomach region or abdominal region, this could just be due to the fact that exercise can shut off digestion because it will activate the sympathetic nervous system to a degree, especially if you're doing very intense aerobic or cardiovascular cardiovascular like workouts. So as I say so often exercise can be a stress especially if you're doing again more of these cardiovascular exercises that have you hyperventilating and physically stress you know secreting a lot of endorphins which are more or less just stress substances anyways. So if you're referring to digestive bloat it just might be that the exercise is a bit too intense and perhaps shutting down digestion and maybe you're eating too close prior to exercise so it's impairing the digestion of that food leading to bloating. But I'm assuming that you're referring to edema or more so an overall like tissue bloat in the face, uh, overall puffy appearance. And again, that is a condition referred to as edema, which is again cellular water retention where the cells uptake a lot of water and that is highly indicative of stress as well. So as I talk about in this video here about the best or worst exercise, one of the downfalls of cardiovascular or aerobic and even anaerobic exercise is that it can increase your serum levels of estrogen and cortisol. So exercise can induce a stress response, as I just said, and it can particularly increase the production of estrogen. And there's actually studies that show that certain types of exercise, more like cardiovascular exercise, like running on a treadmill, can actually double the serum levels of estrogen in the body. So I think cardiovascular exercise, although promoted as healthy, is perhaps the furthest thing from beneficial to your cardiovascular system. Because as I say very often in these videos, so I don't want to sound too redundant, but estrogen can directly lead to edema. One thing that estrogen can do is increase your cells affinity to water. So it can lead to water retention directly. It can have your cells and tissues accumulate more water than necessary and just hold on to fluids. And a prime example of this effect of estrogen is to take a look at a woman who is in the first half of her cycle uh, menstruating wise. So she's getting PMS like symptoms. What happens is the estrogen becomes more elevated, the ratio to estrogen to progesterone, and this leads to pretty much all of the negative symptoms associated with PMS. And one of the major ones is bloating. So women always say that they feel heavier, that they're getting fat or they're more bloated, or some of them even just notice that they're puffy and that they are retaining more water. And again, that's due to the estrogen. And then usually once they start their period, these symptoms start to go away because the estrogen goes down and the progesterone goes up and progesterone is going to have the opposite effect. So to answer your question very simply, it could just be that the exercise is inducing a stress. So a couple of tips is going to be first and foremost, as always, look at the sort of exercise you're doing. You said you're doing weight training. So that's a lot better in my opinion than a lot of the cardiovascular exercises which can be so stressful on the body. However, it is my experience that you can turn weight bearing exercise into a cardiovascular type of exercise if you're doing 
too high of reps or if you're just pushing it too far. So it is possible that you are just still experiencing too much stress even from weight bearing exercise or strength training. So I have a couple of very simple tips in regards to that. One is just body awareness, of course. So every day is gonna change. You know, you're gonna be more resilient to exercise stress if your body is less stressed overall. So some days you might be able to endure more exercise stress, more reps, more weight, longer exercise periods without physiologically stressing the body. So just always be aware that when you're exercising that you stop just before you get too worked up or too worked out. And the basic things to look for again is like if you're losing your breath, if you're running out of breath and can't breathe, and if your form is becoming compromised, then that means stop. Basically, the rule of thumb is that if you can't breathe through your movement and if you can't stick to perfect form through the movement, meaning you start to, you know, force things and just push through the movement and go through the motion as opposed to using good form and the right muscle, then you're usually done. So just be aware of that whenever you're exercising. And my general rule of thumb other than that is to stick to a higher weight in a lower rep range. So my basic rule of thumb to sort of avoid your weight training turning into cardio exercise is to stick in this lower rep range and to get the most out of it because if you're decreasing your rep, it's gonna take more weight to get the same sort of stress or tension on the muscle to build the muscle. So what you're gonna wanna do is lower the rep range but then increase the weight in proportion to your ability. So still sticking to good form, use as much weight as possible without compromising your form. So it just might be 10 or 15 pounds more than what you normally do. But the point of this is to just reduce the likelihood of turning your weight bearing exercise into cardiovascular exercise and going into this hyperventilated state, which would imply or indicate that you are probably stressing the body to the point of secreting too much stress hormone. And the goal of exercise is to increase the amount of the androgen hormones, build up testosterone while keeping the stress to a minimum. So it's a game of balance and it's a delicate balance that's very easy to tip if you're not aware of these things. So I think that's some simple things that you can do, but sort of moving into your next question, could it be beneficial to take yin herbs? And for those of you that don't know what a yin herb is, this is generally a Chinese herb or a class of Chinese herbs that usually act more like adaptogens. They usually support the adrenal and kidney system. They're responsible responsible for the movement of fluid throughout the body. They have more cooling properties and they're more about bringing in the internal homeostasis so that way you have the energy for external like outward motivation or movement which is usually referred to as the yang aspects of the body and nature. So when I think about what the various yin herbs do in the body, they're ultimately anti-stress herbs, a lot of them are at least. You know, when I think of herbs like Hoshu Wu and even cordyceps, I'd consider both a yin and yang jing tonic. Uh, these are herbs that are ultimately proven to have anti-stress effects and they're usually particularly beneficial for reducing stress overall. And considering that exercise can be a stress, I would say that they're definitely worth experimenting with. If you're not already, I usually recommend to most athletes to try supplementing with a combination of cordyceps and the KSM 66 ashwagandha for reducing the various uh, stress, specifically for reducing the production of stress hormones while increasing the production of adaptive hormones. So those are two fantastic herbs to supplement with, but you could also throw in some other yin herbs to see if that helps you. Because the last thing I was just gonna comment on is that even if you're doing exercise, weight bearing exercise, and you're keeping it very non-stressful, if it's inducing a stress response for you, it's very possible that you just have low thyroid function and your body's not coping with any form of strenuous exercise or stress very well at all. So I would focus on getting the thyroid into good shape. I used to bodybuild for years. I was a wrestler and a football player at a young age and I pretty much exercised from the age of 10 to the age of 23 and about ages 19 to 23 I was intensely working out as bodybuilding before that I did a lot of cardio and so exercising was a huge part of my life but when I got hit with really bad hypothyroidism and chronic fatigue and all that stuff I didn't work out for years for like four or five years all I did was walk I'd literally just go in nature 
you know, to walk. That was my only exercise. And I think it's probably the healthiest form of exercise. But of course, if you're somebody that's trying to put on lean muscle mass, for me, exercising always had the appeal because I was a naturally leaner person. And I found that working out with heavy weight was one of the most effective ways for me to put on weight. It, for some reason, just helps to increase my metabolic rate when it's done balancedly in the right amount. And it's so much more effective for me than anything else in regards to trying to put on lean mass and lean muscle. So if you're somebody who's leaner and you know you don't want to give up exercise, it's okay. Just consider it a short-term goal while you get the thyroid into good shape. Because also keep in mind that once you do fix that thyroid, that will help to enhance the overall metabolism, which usually corrects both the problem of being overweight and also underweight and having a hard time putting on muscle mass. So once I knew my thyroid was in good shape again, it was actually really easy for me to put back on the majority of my muscle mass and maintain it. So even if you have to take some time off, just keep in mind that it's not forever. But also if you do want to work out you enjoy it i'm definitely not telling you to stop it's just something to consider all right so moving along getting to our second question this is an interesting one because they're asking about the potential negative effects of ashwagandha which is an herb that we highly recommend often on the youtube channel because it is so well-rounded and corrects so many of the health imbalances that people are suffering with today it's truly an adaptogenic overachiever and i think one of the best herbs anybody could take however she brings up an interesting point and so her question reads i would like to see something about the possible negative side effects of ashwagandha and who should not take it in addition to symptoms of low cortisol so there's a couple interesting things about the question the first thing that stands out to me is possible too low of cortisol. I think that this is a huge misconception, a big conspiracy almost in the health and wellness world because of the idea of adrenal fatigue. So, so many people are being told that they have too low of cortisol. The reason that their immune system is low and that they have low energy is because they don't have enough of this hormone cortisol, which is going to act as an anti-inflammatory and it's going to have all these beneficial things and it's going to basically kick on the adrenals a little bit, just enough to get working. But the fact of the matter is, you do not need to be secreting much of any cortisol at all if you're truly healthy. And the simplest way to understand it without getting too complex in the endocrinology and physiology is to just understand that the thyroid and adrenals work together and they basically work in tandem, meaning that the adrenals really only turn on when the thyroid's low. So there's a balance between the adrenals and thyroid. And the simplest way to look at it is that the adrenal glands are like the emergency backup energy reserves. Whereas the thyroid gland is the primary driver of oxidative phosphorylation or energy metabolism. So when you're healthy and not stressed in a state of homeostasis, the thyroid is doing all the work. It's producing the thyroid hormone, it's driving oxygen, to the cell while supporting the oxidation of glucose so that way your cell can actually produce energy for cellular functions. But only when the body becomes chronically stressed or something's interfering with thyroid function does the adrenal glands kick on and start secreting small amounts of cortisol to actually produce more or less a backup form of energy. So this is not something that you want to rely on. In fact, like TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, this is a hormone that needs to be hardly or rarely secreted if the thyroid is working well and if there's enough progesterone in the body. Because in combination of thyroid hormone driving the production of energy, you have progesterone which helps to protect the body from stress. So it's usually only in hypothyroidism, in a progesterone deficiency, that your body even relies on cortisol. Now of course in the rare case that your body was not producing any cortisol and you became stressed or you started to age and the thyroid was turning down, your progesterone production was slowing down as it does with age or stress, then that could be problematic because in the later years of your life or if you're facing a disease or if you're facing chronic or intense stress and you had no cortisol to rely on at all, then in that case your body just might completely surrender and shut down. But again, I don't think that low cortisol should be a concern for anybody, especially in the modern world and especially if you're just focusing on optimal thyroid function and a balance of progesterone and other adaptive androgen hormones to the stress hormones. So 
The thing that I would recommend is that you focus on improving thyroid function and ensuring you have enough progesterone in your body. Oftentimes, people that are diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, they are just subclinical hypothyroid and they have low progesterone. So I would recommend looking at those biomarkers before you looked at things you could do to increase your cortisol levels and then see how you feel after. But getting back to the first part of your question, I have seen one piece of research. I'll have to look through my computer and see if I can find the study and link it somewhere beneath this video, but the article basically pointed out one possible mechanism of ashwagandha stimulating the production of serotonin. And if you've watched any of our videos on serotonin, then you know that serotonin is an inflammatory mediator. It generally slows down the metabolic rate. It can stimulate the production of cortisol and is not something that you want to be producing chronically. Now, the one thing I'm not entirely sure of is whether or not it's all ashwagandha that can have this effect or if it's unprocessed raw ashwagandha powder, or if it's a certain alcoholic extraction, because there is the KSM 66 ashwagandha that we talk about a lot, which is a patented blend. Not only is it the most pure, meaning it's gonna have no toxic solvents in it and other harsh chemicals that might be contaminated by the extraction process. So it's very pure, it's usually organic when you find it, but it also has the highest active form of withal nights. And from what I know, usually most substances that increase one stress substance increases the rest of them. And since ashwagandha, the KSM 66 ashwagandha, is proven to lower cortisol upwards to 20 some percent, lower prolactin, increase progesterone, increase testosterone, for me that shows it has mostly a very pro-metabolic effect. It's very health promoting. And if it increased serotonin in any way, that for me would be a little bit contradictory. So it is possible that it's just the studies that found that out were using either like a raw, unprocessed ashwagandha or even a ashwagandha that was processed with a toxic chemical solvent. That could definitely be a cause for some sort of inflammatory or negative reaction. This is actually incredibly more common than you think in the industrial food system and all of the industrialized supplements and herbs. A lot of the times, something as simple as like orange juice, for example, a pulp-free orange juice, what they do to get the pulp out of it is they don't mass straight it. They actually throw an enzyme into the orange juice to dissolve the pulp and it's been found that that enzyme is incredibly allergenic to most people. So what's really interesting here is you got to pay attention to the processing and this is one of the major reasons that industrialized foods and herbs and supplements can be so difficult to navigate your way through especially if you're trying to eat an optimally healthy diet because something as pure and healthy as organic cold pressed orange juice if it's been processed with this enzyme to dissolve dissolve the pulp, it might be allergenic to you. So I don't know if that's the case. I'm just speculating that it could be the case for increasing serotonin because serotonin is going to go up usually when the gut is irritated or aggravated. 90% of the serotonin is produced in the intestinal tract. So usually if something's increasing serotonin, it's very likely that it's irritating your intestines. And for me, that's a huge red flag and an indicator that perhaps the oral ingestion of that ashwagandha was irritating to the gut. And a lot of herbs can be gut irritating and cause adverse effects in this way. So that's why I think it's so important to get properly extracted herbs and make sure that they're free of any other additives and solvents and weird harsh chemicals. So honestly, to answer your question, there's not really too many negative side effects I've ever seen associated with ashwagandha, especially taking something as pure and clean as the KSM 66. And again, most things that are increasing serotonin are usually things that are just irritating your gut. And again, you can usually avoid that issue by getting a extract that is pure with no harsh gut irritating solvents or other added chemicals. However, if you are concerned at all about a possible serotogenic effect of ashwagandha, I usually just recommend to people to supplement it with something like ginkgo biloba, which has an anti-serotonin and anti-nitric oxide effect, and that could counter any possible serotogenic effects of the ashwagandha. But again, it's probably not something to be too concerned about. All right, guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If you've enjoyed it and found it helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you are new here. Otherwise, for learning more beyond this YouTube channel, be sure to check out our blog, Online Tonic Herb Shop, and Wellness Academy, all which you can find in the description box below.